Learning to accept God's will in the face of uprooted plans and abandoned dreams may possibly rank among the most trying and most noble acts of faith we can choose to make in this mortal sojourn. This was just as true for Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, and Zacharias as it is for us. Submitting to God's will and timing will make our lives infinitely more than they could be without Him. I invite you to join us in our discussion and encourage each of us to seek divine understanding that the Spirit might teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. Submitting to God's will, to me, means not only trusting God, but trusting that He knows best and what's best for me. To submit to God's will is to trust in the Lord with all thy heart and you know, just fully invest and trust that everything's gonna happen when it needs to happen. Might not be in this life, but it'll happen. I am always a planner and I always have everything in the exact order it needs to be. But to submit to God's will is having somebody that is a better planner than I am and doing exactly what he knows is best. Welcome everybody. My name is Ben Lomu and I'm your host. Joining us today as our scholar is Scott Esplin. Scott is the Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. He is a former seminary and institute teacher. And he and his wife, Janice, are the parents of four children. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Ben. Glad to be here. Thank you. And our special guest today, seated next to Scott, is Janet Erickson. Janet is an associate professor in the Department of Church History and Doctrine at BYU. Janet, thanks for being here today. So good to be here. Thank you, Ben. And we'd like to welcome our studio audience. Thank you all for being here as well. And to the viewers at home, thank you for joining us. Throughout this discussion, we'll ask several questions for you to consider. Join the conversation with us on any of our social media platforms. And for anyone who may need study and teaching resources, we've added a link online to download our teaching resource kit, which includes clips from the show, scriptures, quotes, graphics, and original illustrations. Visit byutv.org slash come follow up for more. Today, we're gonna to base our discussion uh, from the chapters of Matthew 1 and Luke 1 as outlined in the Come Follow Me resource. And the two topics we're gonna to be talking about today are the faithful willingly submit to God's will and God's blessings come in his due time. So let's jump right into our first topic. Uh, Scott, do you wanna give us a little bit of um, background or, or history on these two books of Scripture uh, as we go into studying Matthew and Luke. Sure, I'm happy to, Ben. Uh, Matthew uh, seems to be writing to a Jewish audience, and so he will draw very heavily from the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, numerous times, including in the reading for today, he will say, as it is written in the prophets, or he'll, he'll quote Scripture almost you know, dozens and dozens of times, almost a hundred times. He will quote passages from the Old Testament um, appealing to uh, the witness of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that Jesus Christ is the, is the Lord and Savior, the Messiah. And so uh, writing to a Jewish audience, he will draw from the Hebrew Bible, Jewish text, um, to uh, convince his readers that, uh, this, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Uh, Luke, on the other hand, um, is traditionally written to a Gentile audience. Um, there is uh, traditionally, it's attributed to Luke as being a Gentile himself. Uh, and uh, Luke uh, draws his information, unlike Matthew, who as an apostle would have been an eyewitness to these accounts. Uh, Luke is a missionary companion of Paul. He shows up in the Gospels, uh, or sorry, in the, in the epistles as being a companion of Paul on Paul's missionary journeys. He's called the beloved physician uh, in Colossians. And, uh, and so he seems to be an educated individual uh, writing to uh, likely a Gentile audience. And, and so he'll uh, try to portray the Savior as um, the Savior of all the world. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But uh, the, these two books of Scripture contain genealogies for Jesus. And the way those genealogies are portrayed uh, are, are, are done in a way because of their their audiences and their themes. So Luke will portray uh, Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the entire world, whereas Matthew will draw more directly connections to the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. You know, and that really leads us to the beginning of Christ's life. As we talk about these first couple of chapters, we find this uh, two very similar stories that complement each other so well. 
Uh, Janet, do you mind talking about the, the circumstances between Matthew chapter one, Luke chapter one, and how they go right along well with each other? Yes. It's so powerful how we hear in both, we're getting details about the birth of this, the coming of this Redeemer to whom the, the people of the Old Testament, the children of Israel have looked for centuries. And we will, we will start by learning about Zacharias and his calling to be in the temple. And it's so remarkable, there he is. I think they probably drew lots. It was such a special thing to be able to come into the temple. And he gets to have the special calling of burning incense, which is right in front of the Holy of Holies. And he gets this precious opportunity. I think it was very rare to have that opportunity. And he's there and you hear this beautiful words from an angel who appears in that moment and says to him, and this, this will be here in Luke actually, fear not Zacharias for thy prayer is heard. And I just think that is such a beautiful way to start a section of scripture because every single one of us have prayers. That's right, yearnings in our hearts and unanswered questions. And of course, here's Zacharias is, who could know but God how much he and Elizabeth had yearned for a child and to say, your prayer is heard. And then the angel teaches him a little bit about what that means. And then of course, we will learn that that same angel goes to Mary and he's going to tell her about what's going to happen in her life. And as, a, as kind of an evidence to say, Mary, there are more miracles going on. This is not the only miracle. Elizabeth, your cousin, who's old of age, has also conceived. And in the middle, we'll have Joseph, right? That we learn about in Matthew, in that first chapter where Joseph's like, what? What does this mean for my life? And what should I do? And we see Joseph's response. So we're getting these beautiful examples. Joseph's response to miracles. Elizabeth's, Zacharias's, Mary's. Right, how, how their prayers have been answered and how the question, what are the questions that they have and how God is going to bring about miracles in their life and miracles for the entire world through them. As, as we talk about this, I think sometimes we, we tend to think, okay, this was a miracle that happened a long time ago. Yes. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in reality, what examples do you have of something that we, you would call miraculous that God has shown you throughout your life? It's interesting you would ask, man, because my wife and I had had our family later in life compared to traditional Latter-day Saint family situations. And uh, so I, I, I personally resonate with some of these stories, uh, trusting God and His timing uh, that things work out uh, when He knows best and when I'm ready and prepared and, and have learned the lessons I need to learn along the way. I, I, I resonate with stories like this one. The story of Zacharias and Elizabeth has always been one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, Janet, the, uh, the idea that God hears our prayers and answers mm-hmm. them in His time and His, His will. I, I, I love that story because that's in some ways the, really story, I've, home, huh? the story I've lived, yeah. yeah. Ben, I was thinking, and maybe all of you will resonate with this. Here you get Elizabeth who's been pleading I, I struggled with infertility and, and got married later, like prayed and yearned. I watched all my siblings get married and I'm like, what train did I get off on? Like, where, mm-hmm. what happened to my life derailed? And, and to have that miracle seem like a miracle for sure. And then to struggle with infertility and that's a whole other level. It's, it's a different kind of, of pain and, and yearning. And it's so interesting you have Elizabeth pleading for all these decades. And finally, right, this prayer is answered. And then you've got Mary who's like, this is way before I thought this was gonna happen, right? right. And how life is that way. Mm-hmm. I can think uh, some, some things are like, this is really interrupting at what I thought was going to happen in my life. And others are like, how come this hasn't happened yet? And, and to know that the answer is the same. I hear your prayer, I will answer. And what seems like is not being answered, stay with me, you'll see the fulfillment. And certainly some of those prayers are not going to be answered in this life, but they're teaching us here, sooner or late, they will be answered. For, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing is impossible. Yeah, verse 37, and it, 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 even me finding someone, that's mm-hmm. not impossible. Yes, and, uh, yes, Scott, that's, that's right. That's not <laughs> impossible. Me to find someone to marry. You know, and we talk about, as we study the New Testament, we talk about learning the context and the history and we have two great examples of, in all reality, we study the New Testament so that we can learn to draw from those experiences from those from the past so that we can learn and grow in this life, learning how to apply. And that we're, well, that's what I really think is the beauty of learning about the Savior, 
learning about Mary and Elizabeth is that we can take from their experiences and try to apply them uh, to ourselves. We had, a, we had a great question that came in that deals with this uh, specifically that came in from one of our audience members. I'd like to watch that and then uh, let's get some thoughts on what you guys uh, have to say about it. Hi, I'm Priscilla from Chandler, Arizona. And in these scriptures, we see Mary and Joseph have a lot of trust in God with the different situations that they've been put in. I was wondering how can we put that same sort of trust in God in our own lives? Kim. Um, so first of all, I think that knowing that God is perfect and he knows everything makes it a little bit easier that he can see the bigger plan. Um, recently, I had an experience where I realized, even though I've been raised in the church, that I didn't know if the church was true and that I relied on my parents' testimony and then my husband's testimony, and I didn't figure it out for myself. And at 30 years old, it's really hard to admit that you don't know something that you have been saying you knew for that long. And so um, I was up at testimony meeting and I stood up and I said, I'd like to bear my testimony that I don't know if the church is true, but I do know that it's love. And as I went through that process, I realized that me being vulnerable at that time because the Lord wanted me to show other people that it opened up so many doors because other people were going through that same situation, that it's not always this big miraculous moment. It's more of, okay, like you need to figure it out for yourself. And as I figured it out for myself, I went, oh, okay, Lord, I understood what you were trying to tell me and your plan was a lot better than my plan. Kim, thanks for sharing that. I really do think that there are those that are watching that will hear from your experience and resonate with it and, and relate to you and use that as maybe a stepping stone, maybe a, a first step of faith on, along their journey. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on, on what Kim was saying of trying to exercise faith in, in, in really difficult times? I so touched Kim by your vulnerability and openness. And I, one of the things I think the Lord loves is an honest heart. Like if we're sincere mm -hmm. and, and vulnerable and honest, then he has such a place to work with to help us to come to know him and how he yearns for us to know him. And I love that beautiful witness. I don't know everything. I know this is love and God is love. And that's what I'm experiencing. And I'll go as far as I can, right, in that. And, and that's all of us. We're all, we're all on this beautiful journey of God watching over the growth in our own hearts at whatever that is in all the different stages. And he's certainly doing that with Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias and Joseph in these sections. You know, I, I like the reference to Zacharias. We, I think we've talked about Mary's faith and it's, and it's remarkable and, and I love it. Zacharias has a different encounter with yes. the same angel. <laughs> yes. and, and, and in that sense, I feel like Zacharias maybe more than I feel like, like Mary in some cases. Yes. I, I don't have the perfect faith like Mary all the time because of, he also asks a question. Yes. And so some of us might be more like Mary and, yeah. and more readily believe. Yeah. Others might be more like Zacharias and, and, and need some time. But, but in the end, the Lord gets both of them where I believe he needed them to be. Scott, you have your daughter here with us today. She's, she's so cute and she's awesome. Uh, how, how do you help her learn how to develop uh, that faith that Mary has to, to do things that are that inevitably she's gonna face in her life? How do we teach our children and you specifically uh, with Addie on how to increase her faith? Oh. I think she's teaching me faith more than, you think of you know scriptural passages of faith of a child. But uh, I... Uh, I love Mary's reactions in this story. When the angel appears and tells her she's going to have a child, um, she asks a question. I think that's okay. Yeah. As, as my daughter and other of my children develop faith, I want them to know it's okay to ask questions. Yeah. But I, I, so her question mm -hmm. uh, in-, in How the, is this gonna happen? How is this gonna happen? <laughs> I'm not uh, Verse 34, how, how shall this be? Right. It's okay to ask a question, yes. but I, I love Elizabeth's response to mm -hmm. Mary mm -hmm. in verse 45. Mm -hmm. And blessed is she that believed. Mm. I, I think it, it evidences that she asked a question, but she believed. Yes. There, there's a way in which you can ask questions. Yes. You can even be surprised by what, what may happen in your life 
and yet still believe. Yes. And, uh, and, and as I work with my daughter and, and my children, I hope they feel comfortable asking questions. Yes. But I also hope as they ask those questions, they maintain faith, that they believe. And I love that those around Mary recognize in her a woman who believes. Oh, it's so, as I was reading these, I was remembering how Nephi says, nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. Yeah. And we read those, and that's what you're hearing from Mary. It's so childlike. It's like, I'm not married. I have no idea how this is get, going to happen, but you're, to, you're telling me that it is. And I know God enough to know that I can trust that He will lead to good places and that following Him will lead to good places. And I'm sure from her experience of knowing the Lord enough to know that He will do that. Which Ben, I, when I hear the word submit to the Lord, that sounds like it's always gonna be horribly hard, whatever it is. It's like, <laughs> oh, submit to the will of the Lord, right? And it's so powerful here how just as a loving father would do, every time we submit, it won't be easy, but it will always lead to more than we could have imagined. And so she's willing to submit to the Lord because she trusts. I don't know how he's going to do this. I know it's not going to be easy. And she doesn't even have any idea how hard it's going to be at this point, right? She has no idea what this is really going to mean for her life, but I will trust him. Well, thank you both for sharing your thoughts and from the audience as well on our first topic, the faithful willingly submit to God's will. And for you at home, what strengths and insights have you gained from learning to submit to God's will? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. So some blessings I've been waiting on in life is just, you know, the ability to become successful and be self-reliant. About four years ago, uh, we had the uh, inclination to be moving to Boise, Idaho from Pocatello. It was across the, the state and I didn't really want to. But uh, I put a lot of uh, prayer and fasting into position there, and I felt like that was the right thing to do. I know that God will let the blessing happen when He needs it to happen and when I need it to happen, not when I want it to happen. Over the first couple of years, I mean, it just it felt like, oh man, this was just the wrong choice. What, what were we thinking? What were we doing? And, and things kind of started piling up, and I kept waiting for that. Why? Why did I feel this way? What What's going on here? Um, now things have been changing. I, I'm changing from being a electrician for the last 13 years to becoming a seminary teacher starting the fall. And uh, it's, it's quite a, a life change, quite a career change, but it's been the absolute best career choice I've ever made in my life. Our second topic is God's blessings come in His due time. Uh, I want to revisit uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias and how this second topic fits in with their story. Sure. You know, I, I think something Janet mentioned earlier, uh, the parallels in these stories are interesting. In, in one case, it's God's time is, is in, in much longer than what the individuals anticipated. In Mary's case, it's Earlier. Likely much earlier than she anticipated. So uh, I love a quote that we might look at from uh, Elder Holland. He taught in General Conference years ago, some blessings come soon, some blessings come late, and some don't come until heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they come. Mm -hmm. And I, I love these individuals who, embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ, blessings come in their lives, be they sooner or later. Uh, we've talked already about verse 13. Uh, of course, Zacharias is in the temple performing his priestly responsibilities, as Janet mentioned, offering the incense in front of the, at the altar of incense in front of the Holy of Holies, symbolically representing the prayers of the children of Israel. And, and, and for how many hundreds and hundreds of years have the children of Israel prayed for a Messiah? And, uh, and verse 13, the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. I've wondered which prayer that is. Yeah. Is, it, is it the prayers of the children of Israel? Mm. Here comes the, mm. the prophet before the Messiah. Or is it a personal prayer? Uh, and I, reading the context of this story and the way Zacharias responds, it doesn't appear to me that Zacharias was praying for a child that day. It, it must have been a prayer he offered years, decades before when he thought it was a possibility. And, and I love that concept that, that God hears my prayers and sometimes those answers come soon and sometimes those answers come later 
And sometimes they may not come until heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they come. And uh, God had heard a prayer, maybe uttered years before, and, uh, and the time was now. Jenna, any thoughts on this? Ben, when I read these verses, I can't help but think of a wonderful aunt. Uh, they had a daughter, Eileen, born, and at 18 months old, she got meningitis, and it wasn't, they weren't able to treat it quickly enough, and her growth stopped at like 18 months. And for a period of years, Aunt Ethelyn and Uncle Irving prayed for her healing. People of great faith, they knew miracles could happen, that he had power to do that for them. And after that period of years, she describes going to Sunday school, and as would happen in church, it was all on prayers being answered and she couldn't bear it. And she got up and left the room and her uncle, who was a patriarch, was just outside in the hallway. And she said to him, you know how long we have prayed for her healing. You know that and I know prayers can be answered. Why is he not answering my prayer? And then he just very directly said, Ethlyn, what is it you want for your family? You want those daughters that you have to be close, you want them to love and serve each other. You want those kinds of virtues to be developed in your family. Eileen is the way, and the Lord is answering your prayer. And when she described that, I thought of all the times when I thought, like, what is going on? <laughs> and, and to know He knows every deep yearning of our hearts, and He is bringing those miracles, I think, down to the detail about in our lives, in His way and in His time. And we will know this is why. So when you hear the, the Savior say to, those, to this blind man, he looks at his apostles. Well, they say to him, they say, who sinned? This man who's blind from birth or his parents? Somebody had to have caused this problem. And then how the Savior says to them, neither this man nor his parents. And then this beautiful answer, but that the works of God might be made manifest. And it's as if he brings us to the Red Sea brings us to, to places where we will need His help so that we can know God is love. He is here. He will answer. He will make a way. So, so, so you, great for that story. That's a beautiful story. Do you think that perhaps God, because He knows us so well, He answers the questions that we should <sighs> be asking or the things that we should be praying for? He loves us that much, I think. I'm hoping for a God like that. In my immaturity, can you see beyond my immaturity and give me what I really, really will desire and want? And I think that is what a loving father does. Do you mind if we go to the audience? And I would love to would hear love some that. of their experiences on waiting, on, on a blessing from God. Maybe you're still waiting. Nolan. Yeah, um, I'm 27 and all of my friends are either in relationships or they're married. And I'm the only single person. And like, I. Honestly, like, f uh, like five years ago, like, I saw myself being married and having kids and, like, having a house and all that, and, like, it didn't happen. I, you know, dated, I, you know, did everything that a, a regular LDS uh, person would do, but it didn't happen. And, you know, I had to realize, and it took me a while, but I had to realize that I'm here to serve and I'm here to, like, follow God's plan. That's a, that's a really good example, and it's an appropriate example. Uh, thank you, Nolan, uh, for that experience. It really does show that how relatable these scriptures are. And, and I, I really am looking forward to, to Nolan having that prayer eventually uh, answered uh, and the joy and the happiness that come from that. Uh, but sometimes it does take time. And, and both of you, you had mentioned that um, Sometimes it, you really have to have that faith to rely on the Lord and His timing. What are some things that you've done to have the faith necessary to wait? Yeah, it is hard. When you're in the midst of it, no one, you're like, this is, this is really awfully hard. It's so interesting. I, I love how Elder Holland recently said, the purpose of this life, and he quotes King Benjamin, is to become like a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient. And we're thinking the purpose of this life is to meet my dreams and goals, <laughs> right? And wouldn't a loving God do that? And, and I know in my own waiting, what's a miracle is when I can look back and see, He was trying to help my heart be in a place where I could be the kind of spouse I wanna be. 
where, I, where those dreams would mean something so different because of the change that happened in me across that process of waiting. And that he's bringing about the greatest miracles that enable us to be more in all of our relationships that we truly desire. And that is not easy to have that vision. It takes courage. It takes saying, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna walk with God, even when I'm not sure that the things that I desire are going to be fulfilled. That was beautiful, Janet. Thank you. I, another subtle, you, you asked a question about what do we learn from these stories about how they get through these waiting periods of difficult mm. times. A subtle message in the Gospel of Luke, I think, is the places where Luke situates these characters. Mm. Um, I love that the Gospel of Luke starts in the temple. We could look at the end of the Gospel of Luke, it ends in the temple. Yes. There's something powerful in the Gospel of Luke about the situation in, or the place of the temple in helping me through my mortal journey. You'll notice that after Zacharias is done with his temple service, he goes home. And I, these stories are situated in temple and home. Oh, that's and there's, play, and, and, and Mary goes to a relative. And yeah. there's lessons I can learn from those places and people to whom they turn during their waiting periods for how I can similarly uh, manage and, and learn and bless, be blessed in my waiting periods. You know, as you, uh, as you talk about waiting, you know, the second topic is, it's trusting in God's timing. Mm -hmm. And we see an example where Elizabeth has to wait, whereas Mary, that timetable is really- <laughs> Accelerated. Accelerated, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, do you mind uh, kind of giving us a, a little, um, uh, just a brief explanation of, of Mary and the timing and specifically the task that she's given of bearing not only just a, a, a child, but the son of God. Well, I think, thanks, Ben. I, I think culturally how difficult that meant, must have been to come from a, mm. a, 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 a small village, a, a town in the middle of nowhere, and, and, and to be expecting a child and, and, and imagine the social climate yes. of that. Mm -hmm. And so accepting that. Unmarried. And unmarried and expecting, expecting that. And, yes. and all those, uh, what people must have said and the pressures and, and, asso and those associated things. Uh, I, I, I marvel at Mary um, and her, um, you know, her words uh, to the angel, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy will. Uh, that, that being willing to submit to God's will, uh, trusting his timing sooner or later. Uh, I, I think the same may be true for Joseph. So um, much. He's also in this story and, and thinking about, well, what, what would this mean for me and, and my reputation? and. And, uh, and, and yet he, I love how the book of Matthew describes him as a just man. Yes. And he wants to do what's right. He doesn't want to harm Mary. He doesn't want to hurt her reputation. And he has the courage to, to follow oh. through as well. Thank you. There's a great quote by President Nelson where he talks about the importance of learning about the life and mission of the Savior. He says, the more we know about the Savior's ministry and mission and what he did for us, the more we know that he can provide the power that we need for our lives. And, and that's what it's all about. And that's why I love what we're doing this year and studying about him so that we can make it through these times when we're asked to do something extremely difficult or when we're asked to be patient and wait uh, for a blessing that may come in the next life. And as we kind of conclude this portion of the episode, I would just love to get any final thoughts uh, from both of you? Scott, do you want to start us off? I, I just, I, I, I'm grateful to have been with you, to have learned from the audience and from Janet. Um, I am continually impressed by the people we've read about today. Uh, the faith of Zacharias, the faith of Elizabeth, the faith of Mary, the faith of Joseph. Uh, and like them, I, I celebrate the birth of this babe that condescended to bless and, and uh, to save us all. Mm -hmm. Janet. I've loved, loved it too. I, I was thinking how powerful in Mary's testimony she ends. She just bears witness, almost like she's quoting from the Sermon on the Mount, how the Lord loves the hungry, blesses the meek, wants to feed us. And, and then she, she has this beautiful statement where she says, he hath hopen, helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Like here he has come 
and he, he is the manifestation of, of God fulfilling his covenant. And he sent a being to earth who will never leave us, who will be with us, who will know our experience, who will redeem it, who will overcome it. And it is all him. It's just, there she is. I can't say enough, right? And Zachary says, I can't say enough. He is amazing in his work in our behalf. Well, thank you both for, for your comments, for your insights and audience. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing with us today of your experience as well. And for those at home, stay with us for footnotes, our deeper dive with just Scott and Janet into the scriptures, the context, the history, and more. So the Spirit taught me today in Come Follow Up that everything is on God's timing, which is a perfect timing. Even from sending His Son down to the earth, it was the perfect time and that we all can pay attention to that. Even him sending his son down here being absolutely perfect, then he can decide when it is perfect for me to go to school again or to make that next change in my life. It was a really special experience to be part of an audience and for us to feel together the truth of the words. I think for me, another witness that God loves each of his children and he will fulfill his promises to each of us. Late, soon, He will fulfill His beautiful promises to us. And I felt that, again, witness. His covenant relationship is sure. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience, and now we're looking forward to continuing our discussion with Scott and Janet. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. There was a lot that we kind of hinted towards and maybe touched on just a little bit. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to dive in a little bit deeper. And, and I'd like to start, Scott, um, with going back to the genealogy that we had mentioned earlier. Obviously, the Gospel of Matthew uh, begins with a, a genealogy. We talked about how Matthew was, uh, seems to be writing, uh, directing his audience to an audience that is Jewish and familiar with Hebrew Bible, Jewish scripture. And so in the very first verse, he's going to direct the genealogy to the most prominent characters in Jewish history. Uh, Janet made some really good comments about uh, you know, the four women who mm -hmm. are named or referenced leading up to the reference to Mary, uh, Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and one unnamed, but we know who it is. Mm -hmm. um, she who had, her who had been the wife of Urias, that would be Bathsheba, of course. And so uh, Janet made some good comments about these are uh, individuals associated with uh, complex or maybe even controversial birth mm -hmm. narratives. And that's going to set the frame for Mary, of course. Um, we don't know the dating uh, of Matthew's gospel, uh, but as many would know, there are uh, significant discussions in uh, the post, uh, you know, after Christ's death and resurrection, as the gospel goes to the Gentiles, significant tensions about accepting the Gentiles into this new Christian faith. And and maybe that's, I, I don't know, but maybe that's something else Matthew might be hinting at is, is in addition to these potentially controversial birth narratives, there's also prominent Gentiles who factor into the eventual birth of Jesus. Uh, women who played an imp important role in setting the stage for Jesus' ancestry who, who have Gentile connections. And so maybe it's signaling to the Christian church of the day, we need to let the Gentiles in. They played a role as well. Now, Jenna, I, I would love to get your perspective, and you hinted at this earlier about the role of, of women and, yeah. and specifically with the genealogy. Uh, what thoughts do you have on, on specifically their role and some of the things that were mentioned that sometimes it may be a little bit yes. I don't know, controversial or just um, a little different from the norm? Yeah, I think there's this sort of question of legitimacy almost. Mm -hmm. And here he's saying, these were women who did, who called of God, did work to enable this kingdom of God to go forth. And it's beautiful to think of Abraham, the promise to Abraham was that all the, through him and all Sarah, the all the families of the earth would be blessed. This was not limited to those of his, even his own descendants, literal descendants. It was the entire family of God would be blessed by this redeemer being born. And these women were absolutely essential to that. The other thing I think it's so beautiful is it, it sets right up. Genesis begins with this beautiful description of man and woman working together mm -hmm. in the work of God. And the New Testament starts with that as well. You have Zacharias performing ordinances in the temple in his sacred office. 
And then you have Mary in her sacred work of bearing life and Elizabeth and this beautiful complementarity of roles and responsibilities and, and gifts and stewardships. Mm -hmm. and, and then they, it's in this working together that the kingdom of God goes forth. So I, I love good. that mixing of men and women you know, that brings up a good point, Janet, that, that you know, each of the books of Scripture, the Old Test, each of the collections of Scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament, yes. the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, they, they all begin with the story of, of a family, yes. of ancestry, a man and woman, a and woman. Yes. The, the creation story, genealogies here, you know, in First Nephi, uh, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, it starts with a family. Yes. The Doctrine and Covenants, the first section, of course, is the preface. The second section is quoting Malachi. I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. This, the central role of families. Uh, families are central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. And each of the collections of Scripture starts with that, that theme. And Scott, right here at the beginning, the, the words that Gabriel says to Zacharias in the temple, he references that verse. That verse. The mm -hmm. hearts of the mm -hmm. fathers turn, to, turn the to the children. You think that is the work of Christ, is enabling us to become the kind of people who can be in celestial relationships forever. Perfect. That's what he does. And he's come to do that work. And here's that verse again. And he does that working through families, complicated through as families. they may be. Yes, Good. yes, this healing relationships. Another thing in the genealogy, of course, in, the, in Matthew's genealogy, he's, he's also pointing to this, uh, you know, the number 14. Mm -hmm. uh, numerology within Judaism uh, in this era, uh, with with they had a tradition of, of letters of, of Hebrew alphabet being assigned numbers, and the name David would add up to the number fourteen. And, and, so and just for those that are watching at home, we're in verse seventeen. We're in verse right? seventeen. Through Perfect. Those, those so as you see in out. verse seventeen, so all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations, and from David unto the carrying away into Babylon are fourteen generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are fourteen generations. Generations. Uh, Matthew's trying to make, again, uh, appealing to a Jewish audience, something that would matter to them, the number 14 for David. Th this genealogy, and, and likely the one in Luke, these are more theological statements than they are genealogical ones. Th these aren't family history group sheets as much as they are theologi yeah, theological mm -hmm. testaments that this is the Messiah you've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. This is the Son of God. This is the son of Abraham. This is the son of David. Matthew has crafted, I, I believe, this the way he's portraying this genealogy to make a theological statement as much, if not more, than he is a genealogical one. And, and, and so that's, it shows up in that verse 17 and, and throughout the placement of the women in the story and other things. These are, this is a theological declaration, not, a, not necessarily just a genealogical one. And in this case, Christ does need to come from that line. He does need yes. to be son of David. Mm -hmm. But it's is, that, is that to fulfill the prophecy? Fulfill prophecies, okay. sure, sure, to fulfill prophecies and, and a covenants made to that mm -hmm. family. But but it's not the way that I think people expected it would come. And, and I think that happens in our lives. God fulfills covenants in my life. God keeps his promises to me, but it certainly hasn't always been the way I thought it would happen. In his time, we talked about, you know, waiting for the Lord and his will earlier. And, and I, I think that's a lesson here. God will keep his covenant. God will keep his promises just like he did by bringing uh, the seed of David forth to be king of kings and lord of lords. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He had that right to it. But not the way that the messianic expectation of Jesus' yes. day, it would have come. This is great. There's, isn't it amazing how, how I feel like we covered so much in the, in the first part of the episode, and yet there is just a so wealth of just more. goodness, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, and one major, um, I guess, character that we really haven't talked about yeah. is John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. As you talk about Zacharias and Elizabeth, you know, as she's with child, mm -hmm. um, John has a very significant role and mission uh, at, when it comes to the Savior. Um, Janet, do you want to uh, kind of introduce us to, to John the Baptist, his mission, and Scott, feel free to jump in and, and teach you. us. It's beautiful that I, I love the part when Mary comes to Elizabeth and, and Elizabeth says, who are you? What are you carrying? Yeah. <laughs> because this baby just leaped for joy within my womb. And the special relationship that John had with Jesus is really beautiful. And of course, his whole work was to magnify Christ, to prepare that. So he does it in the womb. I, mean, I love that. He does right. it even was, in the womb. I was talking to someone <laughs> yesterday, the other day about this, these chapters. And, and it, uh, that was his comment to me was, you know, 
<sighs> Even in the womb, John is already doing what he was sent to wow. do, to bear testimony of the yes. Son of God, to yes. prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. He, he, he couldn't be contained. He just, that's who he is. I, I love the description even of the, the people around uh, when he's born. When he's born. What manner of child shall this be mm-hmm. uh, in, in verse uh, 66? Mm-hmm. Who is this that, that leaps in wombs? And, mm-hmm. and, and wow, who, who is this? Sorry, keep going. No, no. I, it's, <laughs> I, I was thinking right at the beginning where, um, where Zacharias is told by, by the angel. This is in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And 16, and how beautiful that he says, first, that he will be filled with the Holy Ghost, which we see the Holy Ghost referenced all throughout these sections, that, that we are magnified by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the presence of the Lord with us. But he says, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, right? That beautiful fulfillment of Elijah's mm-hmm. work, the sealing keys. And then I love this, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So bringing people who are struggling to keep keep the laws that are God's laws, to bringing them into a, a wisdom, the wisdom of the just. So he's for all, he's coming to prepare the way for all people, mm-hmm. wherever they are in their journey, to receive Jesus Christ and know him. So I, then of course we get the be- more beautiful instructions, right? When Zacharias, he's born and he can finally speak, speak again, again yeah, yeah. and his whole heart, like his whole heart comes out <laughs> and how he says, and thou child, and he's speaking to, I, I, I love that the very first thing he testifies of Zacharias does is Christ. Here's this son that they have waited for and they want him to name him Zacharias, all the people do. And he says, no, his name is John. And then he testifies of Christ and that, that the Redeemer who's been born will fulfill the covenant made to Abraham. And he just can't hold himself back from this, this day spring on, from on high that has come to visit us. And then he says, and thou child, and I just picture him holding John, looking into his face, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And then Scott, I love how you'll say to give knowledge, right? What this means for our young men today yeah. as Aaronic priesthood holders. And we'll love hearing you talk about that, but how he just says to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. And then this, through the tender mercy of our God, his covenant love, there it is again, mm. that chesed love again, and whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. And then he says in 79, he's referencing Isaiah. When you hear Isaiah prophesy, right? That he will come to those in darkness and, and who are on the shadow of that this Redeemer will come. And he says that to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. So it's John and Jesus are fulfilling this beautiful prophecy of Isaiah and Zacharias can see it. He can see it and testifies of it. Yeah, how much has he thought about that in the months that have led up yes, to this? Yes, uh, yes. Who is if, this if child? If he knew he was going to get his speech back, how much has he thought <laughs> oh, about what are my words going to be? Yes. I, I like what you said, Janet. Uh, um, this is a great pattern for our own uh, young Aaronic priesthood holders. J- John the Baptist is the prototypical Aaronic priesthood holder. And uh, and mm. and many of the things that, that the angel describes that he would do, if you go back to verses 15 through 17, um, are the things that I want my Aaronic priesthood son to be doing. I, I have a son who's a teacher, and uh, I want him to be filled with the Holy Ghost in verse 15. I want him to turn people to the Lord their God. Um, I want him in verse 17 to make people ready, make a people ready prepared for the Lord. Uh, I, I certainly wasn't that kind of Aaronic priesthood holder. I was uh, more caught up in, in other things, I'm sure, but but uh, these are things I want for my son. I want him to be a John the Baptist who makes people, uh, makes a people ready for the Lord, who is filled with the Holy Ghost, who turns people to the Lord their God. And uh, those are a powerful youth. Uh, Aaronic priesthood holders, young women, um, our youth uh, can do great things uh, yeah. like John the Baptist. And what a, a great example of kind of one of those unsung heroes. You know, I think sometimes, like you mentioned with these, you know, Aaronic priesthood holders in our ward, Sometimes we overlook the significance of what they are doing mm. on paving the way for us to draw closer yes. to Christ. Yes. You know, and I, I never, it just, as you were speaking, it really just dawned on me on the power that exists within these 11, 12, 13, 14 year old boys. Yeah. You know, and one of these other um, kind of unsung heroes that uh, we talk about within these chapters um, that I, I would love to explore a little bit. Is, is Joseph yes. and his role in, in bringing about the birth of Christ. 
Uh, Janet, what are some of your thoughts on, on Joseph and what are some things that we can learn from him and just characteristics in general uh, of the type of man that he was? Yeah, it's so, I love it. So Matthew 1 verse 19 and he's, and it says he's not willing, he, he, she's pregnant and by law, right? There's all kinds of consequences for that. Mm -hmm. And, and he says, he's not willing to make her a public example. Like he, he sincerely deeply loved her and trusted her. And, and he's thinking about it, Mm -hmm. right? This grueling, how does he lose her? Does he, what does he do? And how an angel appears and tells him and explains who this is and not to be afraid. Joseph, don't be afraid. This is all in the hands of God. So before he makes this decision not to put her away, does, yes. do you, how much does he understand about the situation? Does he even know at this point that, that it's... I don't know that we know that he knows. I don't know if she felt like she could I tell him. I don't think the text right? tells us. Okay. In, in yeah. verse 20, I've wondered about this phrase, and while he thought on these things, yes. how long did he think? Mm-hmm. Yes. I suspect it's not a 15 minute thinking. Yes. Yes. Is, is it days, is it weeks, is it months? Yes. We don't know, but yes. um, I, I love what you've said, Janet. Um, he wasn't willing to make her a public example. How many times are we willing to do that to people? Wow. We, we make people public examples. Especially with this, in this age of social media. Oh, social media. It's so easy yeah, and you can so do it behind a, a, you know, a veil of, ex- yeah, a, <laughs> exactly. Anonymity a or whatever. concrete wall of, yeah. you know. He, that's the kind, he, he was a just man. Mm-hmm. Um, as it says in verse 19, he wasn't willing to do this to Mary. Um, and I, I love that about him and, and a kind of person I hope we could be. A, another kind of textual element I, I love, uh, Again, keeping in mind that Matthew is traditionally writing to a, a, a Jewish audience. You'll notice that there's lots of ways the Lord communicates. In, in some of these cases, it's directly with an angel. In others, it's different forms. Um, for whatever reason, many of the communications with Joseph are via dreams. Yes. And uh, in the Old Testament, there was a Joseph who was a dreamer. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we're bringing back that, hey, there's a, there was a story of Joseph who dreamed earlier, and here's a modern Joseph with the same name who dreams. So you'll see that in verse 20, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. If you go over to chapter two, in verse 13, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Uh, In verse 19, coming back out of Egypt, the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And then in verse 22, again, being warned of God in a dream. Uh, This is a Joseph who was a dreamer. And uh, and there was an ancient Joseph who was a dreamer. And I I just, I love Matthew as a a writer Mm. and uh, as a person who points out nuances and uh, and reminds me that the dreams can be a, a means whereby the Lord communicates and I need to be attuned to all of his yes. forms. You know, it's interesting how Joseph the dreamer in the Old Testament yes. led to yes. the liberation of the Israelites. Joseph redemption. the dreamer, <laughs> right, redemption, yes, liberation, redemption. absolutely. Yes, yeah. I love that. The name is Good. important. And I think to that point, Ben, it's interesting to think of women and men and how what we're learning about distinct stewardships or responsibilities. And here, Mary is going to bring this child into life, into being. But she couldn't do it without Joseph. He, uh, she, he, she needed, she's a young girl. Mm-hmm. She needs a provider. She needs a protector. And, and it's such a beautiful thing that here he fulfills this powerful, irreplaceable role of righteous men. You see righteous women and you see righteous men and their interdependence. And she could not have done it without Joseph. As, as significant as she was, this family where he fulfills sacred roles as a provider and in presiding in the sense of, I will watch mm-hmm. over and enable you to be protected in this sacred work and, and a protector. It's, it's really beautiful to think of how he is demonstrating that for us. And, and sometimes that, that, those roles shift with between and a husband and a wife. Sometimes, you know, maybe yes. the husband is in a position where, you know, she's he, providing. Right. And yes. My wife right now, she's uh, she has a she's the stake camp director, and it's a oh. big, big calling. And you're stepping right up. And that's <laughs> so, so I just by default I'm the assistant stake camp yes. director. Yes. No, but it really is. It is you know, a working it, together, right? Because there were times when I had callings that used up my time, and where she was the one who was. While yes. I was in a meeting, she was getting the kids ready and bringing them to church. Yes. And so it really does speak to the importance of- This working together. Absolutely. As equal partners. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it shifts. And sometimes it shifts. And, and yet you see the gifts of his righteous manhood and the gifts of her, her righteous womanhood. And they're not just 
the same. Mm -hmm. They're distinct, right? Absolutely. And, and essential. And so it's really beautiful, right? Helping one another as equals and holding, right, in a sense, an appreciation for our distinct righteous gifts. I look forward, I, I hope someday, to learn more about these characters. Uh, <laughs> I mean, of all, if you're our Heavenly Father, uh, you're going to entrust your son to, to, to a couple on earth. Who are you going to choose? Of all, the, of all wow. the spirit children who have been sent to this earth, he chose these two. Wow. He chose Mary and Joseph. And I'd, when, if, if or when we get the chance, I'd love to know yes. more about them. They're, really, we don't get as much about Joseph as I wished we did. And we get a little bit more about Mary. She shows up again later at the cross and other stories. But, yeah. but still, we don't know as much as I'd love to know about either of them. So much, uh, yes. The people chosen to be the mortal parents in charge of raising the Son of God. That must have been a, a selection. Mm -hmm. And to, to know more about them, I look forward to. You know, we have this little nugget of goodness in, in Luke chapter one, mm -hmm. where Mary just really mm -hmm. bears her soul. Yeah. And we, we see this, you know, Nephi has a similar experience mm -hmm. of just um, a, a song, a praise. Uh, Hannah Jen has one in Hannah Samuel. Had, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Janet, would you mind just kind of walking us through a little bit and teaching us about Mary to. and this experience? and of her song. Love these words. I love it when they're put to, put to music and you can just hear her soul. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Like just as you talked about earlier, Scott, but just she cannot praise him enough and, it, and wants to offer praise. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior. And how powerful to think the, the being within me is the savior on whom I fully depend. I'm bringing him to life but I depend on him, he is my savior. And then this beautiful verse, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, and that word handmaiden, ready to serve God, right? Ready being, I, am, I stand in waiting, right? This maiden in waiting to serve God, to do what I can for his work. For behold, from henceforth all, shall all generations call me blessed. And then she just praises what he has done for her personally, and holy is his name. And then, it's not just me. She's saying, it's not just me who will be blessed of God and honored with this sacred calling. But then his mercy is on all of them, in a sense, that fear him, that are coven in, entering into covenant relationship with him. He hath showed strength with his arm. And then she just, she, it's like, I think so beautiful that she uses words that the Savior will use in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. His mother said them first. Yeah. And I'm sure she spoke and witness of this, uh, planting those seeds of thought and, ha and how she says, he hath filled the hungry with good things. He hath, and the rich he has sent empty away, right? And, and put down the mighty from their seats. So just, right, the Beatitudes that speak of, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Here is Mary testifying of that, personally having experienced it. And then she, it is so beautiful again how she testifies in 44 and or 54 and 55, he hath hope and he hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And it's that covenant love again, covenant relationship of God with us and fulfilled the promise that he, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever, that through, through this child that I carry, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Scott, Janet, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your comments and for your testimonies and for sharing your spirits with us today. And thank you for joining us for this discussion. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions that you may have received. Additional teaching, study, and shareable material and discussion is available on social media, podcasts, YouTube, and through our website at byutv.org slash comefollowup. Please join us next week as we cover Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2, where we'll explore receiving revelation to protect our families and living a balanced life by following Jesus Christ.